Hi, I'm Carlos Sinelli from UCLA, and this is joint work with Chad Hazlett. In this talk, we're going to learn a new omitted variable bias framework for sensitivity analysis of instrumental variables. And to make things concrete, I want to start with a classical example from economics. Our research question here is, what is the effect of an extra year of education on someone's earnings? And the first approach to this problem is to run a regression of log earnings y on education d, adjusting for some observed variance x, such as race, experience, and regional factors. Here, we will reproduce the results of a famous paper from David Card. And this is what we get. We find that each year of education is associated with an increase of 7.5% in earnings. But this regression has some problems. For example, many important variables that affect both schooling and earnings are not included in X, such as family wealth or ability. Thus, our OLS estimate may suffer from what is known as omitted variable bias. So what can we do now? And to the rescue comes instrumental variables. If we can find a variable Z, that first change the incentives to schooling, and second is otherwise unrelated to earnings, meaning that it only is associated with earnings because of its association with schoolings, then we can obtain a valid estimate of the causal effect of schooling or earnings, even without measuring the unobserved confounders yield. And Card argues that the presence of a nearby college, let's call this proximity, may be such a variable for two reasons. First, the students who grew up far from college face higher costs of education. Second, and most importantly, Card argues that proximity to college is not itself confounded with earnings and it influences earnings only through its effect on additional years of education. If we believe these assumptions hold, and that's a big if here, we can then use IV regression, adjusting for X, to estimate the true returns to schooling and will obtain the value of 13.2%. I'm going to give you details on how to compute this next. But Proximity to college is not randomized, so couldn't we have the same problem as we had with OLS? And the answer here is yes. And in general, there are actually two main threats to the validity of an IV estimate. The first one, as we just said, the instrument may not be quote unquote as good as random. And there could be confounders, just like W1 in this graph, that affect both the instrument and the outcome. But even if the instrument is random, there is another threat we need to worry about is that the instrument may affect the outcome other than through its effect on the treatment, such as through W2 in this graph. And this is indeed the case in our running example. For instance, family wealth or simply better region indicators are likely confounders of proximity. So there are something like W1 here, but we did not measure them. So although we propose IV as a solution to the omitted variable bias problem, our IV estimate itself may suffer from OVB. How much can we really trust this 13.2% estimate? To give a precise answer to this question, we need to understand a little bit how IV estimation works. So bear with me for a couple more minutes as we go through the two main types of IV estimation. So I want to start with indirectly squares and two-stage squares as those are the most well-known uh, estimators. Starting with indirectly squares, we need two auxiliary regressions. The first one is called the first stage regression and the second one, the reduced form regression. The first stage regression aims to capture the effect of the instrument on the treatment. And in this example, we find that those who grew up near college had on average an extra 0.3 years of education. The reduced form regression aims to capture the effect of the instrument on the outcome. And in our example, we find that those who grew up near college had on average higher, 4.2% uh, higher earnings. To obtain the IV estimate, we simply take the ratio of these two coefficients. And this is what gets us to the 13.2% that I told you before. Now a closely related approach is called two stage squares. And for two stages squares, we're going to get the predictions of the first stage. Let's call this b hat. And we're going to regress y on the hat. The coefficient of the hat on this equation is our two stages squares estimate. Again, we obtain 13.2%. And this is not a coincidence. In this case, two stages squares and indirectly squares are numerically identical. Now moving to our second approach, which is the Anders-Rubin regression.
Uh, and as a side note, this is identical to Fieler's proposal for the confidence interval ratio. This is what we're going to do. We're going to start by guessing that, that the true cause effect of D on Y has some specific value, say tau naught. Then we're going to subtract from Y this guess of the cause effect. And note that if we are correct, this new variable is the untreated potential outcome. Now also note that the untreated potential outcome should be independent of the instrument if Z is a valid instrument. So if the true cause effect is really given by tau naught, we should expect that the coefficient of Z on this regression is equal to zero. And this is the logic of the anderson rubin regression. So for the point estimate, we're gonna pick the value of tau naught that makes this fee exactly zero. And again, we obtain 13.2%. And this is identical to indirectly squares. For the confidence interval, we are going to collect all values of tau naught such that we do not reject the new hypothesis that phi is equal to zero. And this confidence interval has two important properties that we need to understand. The first one is that it will include zero if and only if we cannot reject that the reduced form is equal to zero. And the second one is that this confidence interval will be unbounded if and only if we cannot reject that the first stage is equal to zero. And this approach has correct size regardless of instrument strength. So to sum up, here are all IV regressions we have, the first stage reduced form and the Nernst Rubin regression that gives us the 13.2% estimate. But note these regressions control for X only. Oops, control for X only. So although they are the regressions we have, they are different from the regressions we want. The regressions we actually want would further adjust for W, as in these full regressions here. How would including W in our V regressions have changed our inferences? This is the main question we'd like to answer. And as, a, as we have seen, a V estimates are just OLS estimates. So we can leverage all sensitivity tools for LS for answering the sensitivity questions of IV. And we are going to start with the simplest sensitivity analysis we can perform, the sensitivity analysis of, of the reduced form and first stage regressions. What can we learn about the sensitivity of the IV from them? And as we have just seen, all IV estimators take this form of the ratio of the reduced form in first stage. Now it's easy to see here that confounders will bring your IV estimator to zero if and only if they can also bring a reduced form to zero. And this leads to our first lesson. When we are interested in the hypothesis of zero effect, the sensitivity of the reduced form is exactly the sensitivity of the IV. That's it. You don't need to do anything else. You can just perform vanilla sensitivity analysis on your reduced form regression. Now note that if confounders are strong enough to change the sign of the first stage, meaning they can bring the first stage arbitrarily close to zero, they are also strong enough to make the IV arbitrarily large. And what I'm talking to you here holds formally for all estimators discussed uh, in this presentation for the point estimate. And for confidence interval, this formally holds for ns rubin regression. But how can we perform uh, OVB sensitivity analysis for any OLS estimate, for example, for the reduced form? I would need an extra 15 minutes to explain that. So here we're going to just see a crash course using the reduced form as the example. We're going to start by characterizing confounding with two sensitivity parameters. The first one is how much residual variance the confounder explains of the instrument. And the second one is how much residual variance the confounder explains of the output. And with this, for example, we can compute what would be the worst possible inference given a confounder with a certain postulated strength. And it's actually very easy to do that. You're going to construct the traditional confidence interval, but replacing the usual critical value of, say, 1.96 with an adjusted critical value T dagger. And this T dagger can be computed, uh, it's a function of the two sensitivity parameters and it's very easy to compute. Now, another useful thing to compute are sensitivity statistics for routine reporting. And these are the, these answer the inverse question of, of what we just asked. So instead of asking what is the worst possible inference given some postulated strength of confounding, we're gonna ask ourselves what is the minimum strength of confounding needed to be problematic? And we have two sensitivity statistics for answering that, the robustness value and the extreme robustness value. And I'm gonna tell you more about it later. 
And finally, we can compute formal bounds on confounding as strong as observed covariates, and this can help us leverage claims of relative importance of variables. Now, moving to the sensitivity of the IV estimate itself, this can be easily performed within the Anderson Bean framework. Again, so for a choice of time naught, we're going to create our putative potential outcome and run the Anderson Bean regression as before. And the key thing to know here is that performing all less sensitivity analysis for the new hypothesis that phi is, is equal to zero is exactly the sensitivity analysis for the new hypothesis that causal effect is equal to tau naught. The key difference here is that now the parameters are in terms of the residual variation explained of the instrument and the residual variation explained of the potential outcome. Finally, we can recover all possible inferences given some strength of confounding by simply inverting the Anderson Bean test with the OVB adjusted critical threshold that I just uh, told you about. And with this, we can get all usual OLS sensitive results for the IV estimates, such as robustness values and contour plots we're gonna see next. So now we're ready to go back to a running example and we're gonna start by examining the sensitivity of the reduced form estimate. So here is our proposal for a minimal sensitivity reporting table. We start by replicating the original estimate, standard error and t-value. And here we provide the sensitivity statistics, uh, the extreme robustness value and robustness value, which I'm gonna explain to you what they mean right now. So the robustness value is telling us that if confounders explained only 0.67%, both of the residual variation of the outcome and of the instrument, this confounder is already sufficient to explain away the reduced form and hence the IV estimate. Moving to the extreme robustness value, what it's telling us is that if we're not willing to impose any constraints on the association of the confounder with the outcome, then these confounders will need to explain only 0.05% of the residual variation of the instrument in order to be problematic. Now to put these numbers in context, here we have a bound on the strength of confounding if it were as strong as SMSA, which is an indicator variable of whether the individual lived in a metropolitan area. And as we can see, confounder as strong as SMSA would be able to explain 2% of the residual variation of the outcome and 0.6% of the residual variation of the instrument. This implies a new critical value of 2.55, as I explained to you before. And this, since the T value is less than this new uh, OVB adjusted critical value, we conclude that confounding research strength would be strong enough to be problematic. So as we can see, the sensitivity of the reduced form already tells us a lot, but we may be interested in other hypotheses other than the zero null hypothesis, and we can easily assess the sensitivity for any null hypothesis with this uh, contour plots of the lower and upper limit of the Anderson confidence interval. So let's start by examining the sensitivity contour of the lower limit of the confidence interval. In the x-axis, we have the partial square of the confounder with the instrument. In the y-axis, we have the partial square of the confounder with the potential outcome. Here in the lower corner, we have the original lower limit, which is 2.5%. Uh, now, as we move towards this direction, confounding gets stronger and eventually brings the lower limit to zero or eventually makes the lower limit unbounded. And these red diamonds here uh, provide bounds for confounding as strong as SMSA or as strong as an indicator of race. And in the right-hand side, we have the same thing for the upper limit. So what these plots are telling us is that, for example, if we cannot rule out as confounding as strong as SMSA, then we cannot rule out anything between minus 2% and 40% for the causal effect of interest which is uh, pretty uninformative for this uh, case. Uh, so now let's wrap up this presentation. So just like uh, proximity to college, uh, most instrumental variables are not really random and they could affect the outcome other than through its effect on the treatment. The bottom line is that instrumental variables can also suffer from omitted variable bias, so we should always assess the sensitivity of our IV estimates. But on the bright side, assessing the sensitivity of an IV estimate is as easy as assessing the sensitivity of an all assessment. For instance, for the zero null hypothesis, the sensitivity of the IV reduces to the sensitivity of the reduced form. And for the general case, we can easily perform sensitivity of the IV within the Anderson framework. 
everything I'm, uh, I showed you here is actually very easy to compute, but we are also gonna provide software for the full-fledged IV sensitivity, and this will be available soon, both for R and Stata. Uh, 